right. Welcome, Rumblers, and some YouTubers, mostly Rumblers, but I have YouTubers too. Uh, how are you today? Then we have, oh, wait a second. I, see, I always got to make sure everything's running. Okay, so something's running in the background. Hold on a minute. See, this is a professional operation, you can see. All right, there we go. So, um, yes, I have with me today somebody that I heard speak several years ago at one of our defense attorney conferences and just blew me away with his, um, with his stories and his commentary and his intelligence and knowledge and, of course, his position, which is everybody admires the Innocence Project and the work the Innocence Project does. And uh, Chris Fabricant wrote a book called Junk Science, and it was, it was I, I would say it's one of, you know, and law books get kind of boring, right? It's like, okay, it's law. This book brought to life the issue of forensic sciences in a way that no other book for me has done. And I am just honored that he came. So Chris, would you introduce yourself to the peoples on Rumble? Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm glad you enjoyed the book. I'm Chris Fabricant, I'm the director of strategic litigation at the Innocence Project. And uh, the, the book Junk Science comes really... I would say the the story arc in it is about an individual, and then well, let's 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 talk about the dirt, right? There was some sailor who murdered a husband and raped this woman and bit her on the thigh, and killed left a bloody scene, and she she said it was this sailor, and they took and there was a bite mark on her thigh. They took like fifteen hundred of these sailors from this ship, tested their teeth marks, and matched the guilty one. And sent him away to prison for what thirty five years, based on this bite mark evidence. So, uh, what was the result of that little uh, bit of science? Well, so Keith Harward is the my client whose story opened the book opens the book, and you know, Mr. Harward was a sailor on the USS Carl Vinson in the late eighties, and as you noted, there was a couple that was living in Newport News, uh, Virginia, which is where the USS Carl Vinson was dry docked at the time. And somebody broke into their home, um, went upstairs, and while the couple was in bed, had um, beat the husband to death with a crowbar and then sexually tortured the wife for three hours while their children were asleep the entire time. And um, she never really got a look at the sailor's face. The, he at one point blindfolded her using a spare diaper that he had found to prevent her from seeing his face. And she never cried out during the entire ordeal because he told her that he would attack her children if um, she did so. So um, just to correct your story a little bit, what happened was is that um, the sailor left. Um, they, they knew he was a sailor because the one of the the, the wife who survived um, saw that um, it had been a sailor, and that the ranking, um, the insignia on his sleeve, suggested a low-ranking sailor. And that was essentially the only evidence that they had to go on in the case. And that, other than he was white, he was about five ten, um, and weighed 150, 160 pounds, and that was really it. But when they were searching for potential suspects because there's a Navy base there and there were thousands of sailors, there was about 1500 sailors that matched, you know, that basic description. And so what they did is they took photographs of the bite marks on Teresa Perone's thighs. And unlike so many of these cases, they knew that there were bite marks because she had survived and said that the, the perpetrator had bitten her. And they, so they lined up and they got all these dental x-rays from all of these sailors and tried to match them to these um, Teresa Perone's thighs. And they actually had identified Keith Harward as a potential biter and then eliminated him during this big dragnet. And so they ended up actually not being able to arrest anybody. And what happened is months went by and, you know, I was able to find documents that were from the U.S. Senate where Senator Alphonse D'Amato and another senator weighed in and putting a lot of pressure on Newport News Police and the U.S. Navy to identify a perpetrator. But they really didn't have any leads. They had no confession. They had no eyewitnesses. There was no forensic evidence and no fingerprints in the in the apartment or anything else. And finally, Keith Harward um, had gotten into a drunken dispute with his girlfriend. Um, she hit him in the head with the frying pan and he bit her on the shoulder. They both get arrested. 
And what happened is that the local detectives who were investigating the case had um, identified or were made aware of the case. Keith Harward generally matched the description, although, uh, I'm sorry, I said the perpetrator has wore a mustache. The perpetrator is actually clean shaven. Keith Harward wore a mustache. But apart from that, he matched the description. He was around the right age. He was around the right, he was white. He was a sailor. He was a low ranking sailor. He's USS Carl Vinson. And now he's a biter. And ultimately what happened is that that was enough evidence, even though Teresa Perone could not identify him. They brought in these, you know, so-called experts on bite market ev evidence had um, matched him to those marks on Teresa Perone's thighs. And he was convicted. He was almost um, put to death. He, um, during the sentencing proceedings, his parents got on the witness stand and begged for his life. And Keith told me at one point that it was the only time he'd ever seen his father weep in his entire life was from the witness stand begging for his son's life where he didn't know that he was innocent, you know, and that, and died before Keith Harwood was exonerated. And the junk science was so persuasive that Keith Harwood's own brothers began to doubt his innocence because they watched the testimony of a doctor named Lowell Levine give that matched his, um, his teeth, his little brother's teeth to the marks on Teresa Perone's thighs. And so, you know, I lead the book with that because when I was hired at the Innocence Project in 2012 um, to start the strategic litigation unit, we were going to identify the leading forensic techniques that had led to wrongful conviction and attempt to eliminate them and attempt to find people like Keith Harward um, who had been locked away for a long time on junk science. And that was amongst the first cases that my paralegal had identified as somebody that, you know, had been convicted on bite mark evidence. And that was the primary evidence in the case. And since that time, you know, I've been in the lawyers of my team have been involved in eight, eight exonerations involving bite mark evidence. And now we know that there are nearly 40 attributable to this technique. And that's just one of, you know, many, many forensic techniques that have led to wrongful conviction. Well, and, and one of the things I want to emphasize about your book, I mean, is this, the, he, this fellow was, your client was exonerated after what, 35 years in prison? Yeah, 34 uh, in, in the end, yes. And one know. of the things, like you said, there's no pictures of him on his 30th birthday. There's no pictures of him on his 40th birthday, right? And you go through this, Basically, he's a non-entity. He's been thrown into the prison system, forgotten about by the world. Now, one of my questions that I have, and, and I, I just don't remember this detail, and I'm sure the, the chat will be curious also. How was the DNA evidence that exonerated him ultimately retained in the case? How does that work? You know, it was, it was um, you know, so many um, innocence cases never get litigated at all because you cannot, can't find DNA evidence, right? It's not preserved. It's destroyed. It's lost. It's missing. The prosecution refuses to test it and the courts won't order it, you know? So there are always, you know, um, endless roadblocks to discovering the truth, even when the truth is right there to be tested. But often it's not there and we can't find it. And when we took on Mr. Harward's case, I, I had a law clerk who was um, a law fellow who was working for me for maybe six months or something. And it was, you know, Mr. Harward's case was one of many cases that we were looking at at the time. And I just gave him, I tasked him with kind of researching the background of the case and seeing if he could find, you know, evidence associated with it. And he called the Virginia Supreme Court, spoke to a law clerk. And we were looking for the transcripts and some of the other, um, you know, related, you know, materials from the, the trial. And they didn't have anything like that. But what he said on the phone was that we do have this box of evidence, you know, I mean, it's marked evidence, you know, I mean, and it's like, are you interested in this? Like, yes, right? yes, don't touch it, don't touch it, right? Yeah, we are very interested in that. And then Ultimately, what was inside was all the DNA evidence. the The rape kit was in there. Some of the other the cigarette butts that the, now the, when, let's. I want to define some terms here because people get confused sometimes. Because I've actually contacted the University of Michigan's exoneration page once because I thought I had a case that was an exoneration, right? And I said I got an exoneration, and they looked at me like, "No, you didn't. You got a not guilty." 
What is the difference between not guilty and actual exoneration? I mean, typically what an exoneration would mean is that somebody was convicted and then ultimately the conviction was overturned and the person was either declared innocent or the conviction was vacated, overturned, and then they dismissed the indictment, right? You know what I mean? And so there's no more case. So because well, yeah. in your in Mr. Harwood's case, there was actually identified the the perpetrator, right? I mean, the DNA came back with a fellow. Tell him talk about the fellow that was actually identified. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and this is you know, Mr. Harwood's case was a textbook DNA exoneration. You know, what I mean, so not only you know, so the there were multiple um, DNA samples uh, that were available from the crime scene. And they were redundant. In other words, it was the same male DNA that was found all over the crime scene and in the rape kit. There was nobody else's DNA in there, including her husband's and certainly not Keith Harward's. And so they knew that the same person had deposited all this DNA. And um, moreover, and this is kind of, you know, the, the I think I called it the checkmate of, of innocence litigation in my book, is that... Um, the prosecutor, to his credit, would allowed the, the DNA to be uploaded to CODIS. This is a national database for uh, DNA, which has um, folks that have been convicted of crimes and other, you know, kind of military people or others that have had to give out DNA for one reason or another. It's in a national DNA database. And so when we uploaded that, it came back, you know, we had a full profile and um, it came back to a sailor who was a wall at the time named um, Crotty and um, Crotty had gone on after the horrific crimes that were committed to uh, the Perone family had gone on and committed dozens more, you know, crimes and died in prison in 2010. So he was already dead um, when Mr. Harward was exonerated, but it was plain that Mr. Crotty had been the person who had committed this crime. And Virginia, which is a very, very tough place to litigate any cases and including innocence cases, but after Mr. Crotty was identified as the perpetrator and it was so plainly obvious that it was him, the attorney general called the press conference and um, asked the Supreme Court of Virginia to make a you know a quick determination on innocence because they were conceding innocence in the case and the Virginia Supreme Court was considering the case and my colleagues Dana Delger and Olga Axelrod and I were all at the Innocence Network conference actually in San Antonio and I was giving a talk and then we went into the side room and watched this the press conference by the Virginia Attorney General. We got on a plane that night flew to to Naughty Way prison in uh, Virginia and walked him out of prison the next day after 33 years, 34 years of wrongful imprisonment. It was quite wow. something. I write about a scene in the book where we're right. waiting, waiting for the exoneration. It was the most emotional moment I'd ever experienced. I could imagine. Well, I, I don't have quite such a story. That is, it is in the annals of defense attorney history. That's a, quite a story. But, you know, one of the things is there's a whole this type of thing is very rare because there are many people who are wrongfully convicted where there is no forensic science that you can actually test it so the error rate is really unknown in false convictions oh yeah i mean i, I have you know i'm waiting for an opinion right now in the jimmy genreich in, uh, case in colorado which is um a case that i mentioned and i wrote an update to my book recently that's gonna be out in a month that um, talks about this more, and it's also discussed um, now, is he was convicted entirely on um, tool mark evidence. They claim oh, we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Yeah. Go, go. That, I'm, I actually, I know this case. Talk a little more about it, though. Right. So Jimmy Garnick was con convicted of a series of bombings in Grand Junction, Colorado in the late 80s and early 90s. And essentially the only evidence that connects him to these bombs are um, testimony from uh, an expert witness from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms who claimed that Mr. Genrich's knockoff wire cutters, you know, they're made in China, perhaps tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of these tools were the only tool uh, ever manufactured in the history of time that could have made the scratch mark on um, one of the detonated bombs. And that was the only direct evidence of guilt in the case. And so 
we have, you know, been litigating it for several years and have asked the courts for a new trial that would be a fair trial that would be based on reliable science and not this kind of grossly exaggerated at best claim that only our clients tools could have made that mark. So, but we don't have DNA evidence in the case. So it's very hard to get to ground truth. You know, there are no witnesses, no motives, no confession, no other evidence. Well, let's take a step back before we get into some specific um, areas of forensic science that we can talk about. And one of the things in your book that I just found fascinating was how at this bite mark evidence sort of flared up as this great new forensic tool. And then there became sort of an organization of people that could give you this, this um, bite mark <laughs> evidence, you know, and then there was a specialized group and then they started charging fees and they started come up with a little organization and they came up with little handbooks and, and there became this whole little cottage industry about bite mark evidence. And, and the reason I found that fascinating, not was that you debunk the bite mark thing and that's gone and we don't have to deal with it anymore. But the fact that I see similar things being replicated in other forensic science disciplines in that there becomes a little industry that's almost like um, institutional inertia. Do you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> bite marks are just a paradigmatic example of how junk science gets into criminal courts. You know, I mean, is that, you know, is a really um, neat way to kind of demonstrate how a forensic technique can be invented out of whole cloth with no actual foundational research, basic scientific research, and really just based on credentials and case law. And, you know, so bite mark evidence had been really, I mean, what was happening in like the late 60s, you know, mid 60s, really, is that forensic scientists were becoming more and more mainstream and um, and people were kind of understand they were becoming pop culture phenomenon, right? And that prior to World War II, there was no such thing as like forensic scientists as a career. There were, you know, and there weren't television shows that were lionizing forensic experts as crime solving, you know, sleuths, you know, or this kind of thing. And in the post-World War II era, though, that became increasingly a professionalized field. And what you had were um, the FBI crime lab opened, the crime labs from around the country, state crime labs began to open. And forensic pathologists in particular was one of the first of these uh, fields to organize and start offering board certification to its members. And that was an important credential in court and that, um, and that they were becoming expert witnesses that were not just doing cause of death, but were also doing manner of death, like deciding whether or not something was a suicide or a homicide or this kind of thing. So they were becoming like, you know, central to the adjudication of criminal cases. So the forensic dentists or forensic odontologists, as they call themselves in court, were always part of this um, culture to a degree because they were working in medical examiner's offices, but they were doing was something that I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with when you hear stories about a body burn beyond recognition that can only be identified through dental records. You know, we've all heard those stories, but few have an understanding of who it was that was doing that identification, right? And that's your friendly neighborhood forensic odontologist. And, you know, that was pretty straightforward work, right? If you have a plane crash and there are 100 people on the plane and, you know, we have a Jane Doe, but we know that um, that there is a person on the plane who has as female and that has a gold filling in their you know third molar, and you find a body that has a gold filling in a third molar, and we know that Jane Doe is missing. We can identify this person, right? So forensic dentists have been doing that for a long time, but that's not the kind of work that solves crimes. That's not making identification like matching a bite mark or something like that to testify as an expert witness to become a celebrity like some of the other forensic experts who were becoming at the time and not making money as expert witnesses. And so I sued to get into the American Board of Forensic Odontology. This is the board certifying entity of these jokers and um, to get into their archives to do some research and see where all of this really actually came from. And they wouldn't want, didn't want to let me in because I was a critic. So I had to sue under First Amendment grounds. And um, what I found in there was that, you know, in the early 60s, there was a group of dentists that were doing this type of work and wanted more. They wanted to become part of the criminal investigation teams. 
And they started pointing at bite marks as something that they could use to identify perpetrators of crime. And so they were in the morgues and they were looking at injuries that they believed to be bite marks. But, you know, as we know now, is that dentists are no better at identifying a bite mark than you and I are. And the image that you have in your mind is like, you know, that you see with toddlers come home from daycare and say, oh, Johnny bit me, right? And you could see a bite mark, but that's never what they look like in case worth. These are diffuse bruises that could be anything. Right. But it's they, an tooth killer, right? Right. Well, that was Ray Crone, right? He went to death row, who was innocent on a bite mark case. And the, um, and so Which what is happened- cited, by the way, just a commercial at, in my death penalty debates book, which is on pre-order, it's at the printer right now, stevegosney.com, death penalty debates. He is, uh, the Snaggletooth Killer is one of my examples against the death penalty. It's a book that summarizes the, the case for and the case against the death penalty. Is it in net positive or in net negative? Little plug. Yeah. I, have this, I have a rumble rant I need to get to real quick here. Torgo the White says, thank you for your rumble rant. Love your books, Gosney. Uh, keep up the fight. Chris did that paper by Judge Kaczynski, Criminal Law 2.0, have any effect on stopping some of this nonsense? Kaczynski's, uh, no. I mean, I, I've cited Kaczynski's work. He was, you know, important in terms of saying out loud some of the problems with particularly Brady violations and prosecutorial misconduct, although he did have a thing or two to say about um, forensic sciences. You know, what's interesting is that the, the whole term junk science and I'm getting away from this story that I was telling about how bite mark evidence got into court, but you know, just to focus on Kaczynski for a moment, what happened with uh, you know one of the reasons that I called my book Junk Science is because the term was coined for civil litigation, and it was a book called Galileo's Revenge that had first coined that book, and that was because the corporate bar was getting tired of junk science being used to sue them. And so Galileo's Revenge was cited by Kaczynski in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in the Dauber case. And the Dauber case was the case that changed the way the courts are supposed to be evaluating so-called scientific evidence before it's right. admitted. And, and most, most states have now, and even Florida, reluctant Florida, is dragged kicking and screaming into the Dauber world. Are there still fry jurisdictions? Um, yeah. So some of the, you know, and, and Florida went back and forth like three or four times. Yeah, right? it was a Where turf went. battle between the Supreme Court and the legislature. Yeah. And the plaintiff's bar and the corporate defense bar. Right. The uh, so plaintiff's bar, you know, I mean, they they like that, um, you know, they like fry, you know, I mean, and uh, the corporate Cause it bar leaves like, the wide open. We can bring in anybody and let them opine. Let the jury decide. Right. Well, I, let me let me fo- refocus this because um, one of the things. OK, so. The bite mark thing, I mean, I think that that, that that body is pretty well buried. I haven't seen a lot of that. Now, I have I, think, I have a pretrial homicide case right now. Oh, really? Okay, speak too soon. Mark. Everybody always wants to tell me that bite marks are dead. I wish it were true. I have three clients on death row that are put there by bite marks right now today, and I have a pretrial homicide case in New Jersey. Okay. So it's like a, it's a beast that won't die. Well, None what other – now let's – so I want to expand our umbrella because it's interesting – that the advent of DNA, which is considered, I would say, the gold standard of forensic sciences, is the very science that has now debunked or at least put a comparison scientific validity to these other junk sciences. And where are you, where are you seeing the most problems? Okay, let's say, let's leave bite marks. We've talked about bite marks. What other areas? I mean, you can say tool marks if you want. Right. (laughs) So, you know, firearms and tool market analysis is, you know, the grossly overstated and and wild speculation still passing as scientific evidence or shaken baby syndrome or polygraph evidence of blood spatter. There's um, what else do we have? You know, hair microspecy. We have forensic voice analysis, 911 analysis, cadaver dogs, um, explosive sniffing dogs. We have like, all, you know, the, the list of discredited handwriting evidence is really, really long. And, you know, the um, and, you know, really the you know, there are very, very few. I mean, one of the things that, you know, comes up a lot and this is true with the especially true with the 2009 National Academy of Sciences report in the state of forensics and and virtually all the findings of that were backed up by the president's count uh, advisors the president's council of advisors on science and technology the PCAST report and what was you know you go back to like 
you know, firearms experts will claim the, the you know, that only that gun should have could have fired that bullet to the exclusion of every other gun manufacturer in the history of time, right? And it's called individualization testimony. And we've seen that type of testimony where it's saying that that's the source of that crime scene evidence, right? We see it in firearms, we see it in hair microscopy, we see, we see it in bite marks, we see it in fingerprints, we see it in tire treads, we see it in shoot uh, footwear impression evidence, we see it in all these techniques saying that that's that evidence came from that source or from that defendant, right? And what the NAS report said for the first time, right, that the, any mainstream scientific organization and the NAS is the most prestigious scientific entity in the United States, if not the world, said in 2009 that the only technique capable of identifying the source of crime scene evidence is forensic DNA analysis. And that is nuclear DNA analysis, not mixture interpretations, which we're getting now, right, single source DNA. So all these claims that have been accepted by American courts for a century are bogus. You can't say that. Can't say that that's the only gun. Can't say that that's the only hair. Can't well, and say this, that this is the objection. And the thing is, is that I, as, as a practicing trial attorney, right? I, well, I used, to, I used to, my certifications in trial, I do appeals now, but my board certifications in trial, and I've done probably 80 trials. It's good enough to put up there your witness that says, this is a 38 caliber handgun. This bullet is a 38 caliber bullet. This, there's, there's been five, there's five rounds here. One has been fired and this guy was killed by a 38 and that gun was found on his, on his person. You know, that's enough. You, right. you don't need to go that extra step and say, this bullet was fired by this gun to the exclusions of all other handguns in the world which they cannot say scientifically because there is no database of firearms or firearm barrels. Precisely right. You know I mean? And, and, you know, and I, I have this, you know, debate all the time. There's no reason to gild the lily like that. Right. You know I mean? It's funny. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's just like, it's, it's prosecutorial aggression. You know, they, they, they're so committed to finding guilt rather than just being advocates for the truth. And I really, I'm, I'm sort of a flag waver for prosecutors. I think of all people, prosecutors need to be thoroughly familiar with the Innocence Project and the exonerations that are done and why those exonerations occur and why false convictions. I think it's a professional and moral responsibility on the part of all prosecutors to know where false convictions are coming from. Absolutely. You know, I mean, in Chicago, the police officers are required to take training on wrongful convictions to avoid tunnel vision and some of the other things that lead to wrongful conviction. You know, I mean, it was, you know, before the advent of forensic DNA testing and, and the establishment of the Innocence Project, you know, wrongful conviction was thought to be a vanishingly rare occurrence, you know, if it ever, right? You know, I mean, and that what we learned, and a lot of this was through importantly, the intake criteria at the Innocence Project, which was really, really key to so much of what, like the reforms that have like resulted from the reality of wrongful conviction. And that was that there were no subjective judgments made about the guilt or innocence of anybody that was applying for our help, right? So the only criteria was if biological evidence can be found and tested, would that prove innocence if it came back, you know, the way that clients were saying that it should. And that's the only criteria. So it didn't matter if there were six eyewitnesses, or the, the client had confessed, or that there were, you know, snitches, or that, you know, whatever, or that there are other forensic evidence that was pointing to guilt. That was the only criteria. And so as a result, you know, we took cases where there was, you know, apparently, you know, appellate courts had always found overwhelming evidence of guilt, right? You know, I mean, and, and the rest, you know, I mean, what we found is that we had cases where six eyewitnesses were wrong. We had cases where eyewitnesses, you know, had said, I'll never forget that face, you know, I mean, and they're pointing out, yeah. you know, I mean, and they were wrong. We had cases where our clients. Well, and, and the false confessions, people. false confessions are surprisingly common um, right. the most painful case of my career was somebody who i believe was actually innocent but falsely confessed and people right. have a very hard time understanding but i think it's like what in the 20 percentile yeah it's um, the third leading contributing factor to wrongful conviction 
Okay, you know I've got mean? a couple rumble rants I need. And feel free not to ignore these, but I have to read them since they paid me money to actually read them. So I, this I is the choice of... Huh? I don't, I don't see them. I'm not sure what you're oh, talking I'll about. read it to you. It says, Woodchuck says, can you defend working with Kim Kardashian? I like IP, but she consistently race grifts and pushes misinformation. You don't, I'm just reading. Uh, Woodchuck <laughs> also asks, also, can you comment on the comment that IP guy made on Joe Rogan where he said Kamala is the superior candidate, even though she fought to keep innocent people in jail while she was California AG? Okay. Feel free to comment or keep moving. Uh, I uh, anybody that's supporting our work, I'm um, I'm supportive. I, yeah, I have no beef with Kim Kardashian. <laughs> certainly, <laughs> I, uh, she seems fine. You know, you know, good on her. Happy okay, for her. Okay, fair enough. No, it's just these are. This is what you get with the wild, woolly world of the internet. Um, right. So, so we've talked a little bit about, um, and I'm I'm a, I've been a very much of a flag waver for the gunshot matching tool mark thing and people hear me they, they kind of get sick of me ranting and raving about it because i see it so much florida department of law enforcement i'm reading these appellate transcripts and here's this fdla expert testifying this was a match and i'm like ah and there's no daubert motion there's no objection there's nothing it just flies in and I, it just it drives me nuts and i'm looking for the case that i can like feed my trial division like when we get one of these things that we can really test it but um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, courts are starting to wake up to the reality that this has been, you know, largely accepted without any real scrutiny. And they're starting to rein in some of the claims that have been widely accepted where, you know, as you point out, you know, I mean, like prosecutors are going to be able to get their convictions. You know, I mean, is that, you know, the, the sky is not going to fall if they don't, you know, exaggerate at best the probative value of a so-called match. Right. You know, I mean. There is a there there with um, firearms and tool marks, right? You know, particularly firearms. You know, you could say what class of gun may right. have fired this particular. Which is product. which is good and not usually if you have enough evidence, you're not going to need that type. And I, people, um, you you UD in the the chat, she says the Murdoch trial. Um, I, I commented. I we do these things where we comment on trials as they go, right? So that's I I could do that occasionally for my law tube friends and uh, you know and murdoch was one of them i got wrapped into and there was a murdoch trial they there was testimony that the shell casing that was ejected from the ar-15 rifle blackout rifle matched the ar-15 for mr murdoch and i'm like they can't do that they can't say that but that that came in and that i think that was very powerful evidence against mr murdoch Oh, it always is, you know, I mean, and what jurors and and others and certainly the general public don't really understand is that that's just a totally subjective judgment call by a firearms expert. Right. You know, so the idea that to, you know, that the stria that is imparted from a, uh, a gun onto a bullet and that matching those stria marks you know those individual scratch marks on a bullet to those that are found in the rifling of a barrel like that match is just somebody eyeballing this and i'm under a microscope right so they're just taking like you know a test fire and a, a, a bullet from a crime scene and deciding that these two things were fired by the same gun and what even within that bullet there will be parts of the bullet that don't match Right. And they they will concede this. Right. But they match up what they feel are, you know, concurrent or concordant marks. And then they declare a match. There's no threshold. But, and, and what they do is they're given a, a handbook and it's like, OK, you're you're to look through this microscope and you're to see if there's 13 things and you say it's a match. Well, where does that handbook come from? And who says that? There, what? How is this reproducible? How is it falsifiable? Right. See, this is the, the key hallmarks of any kind of scientific testimony is that it's falsifiable. Now, right. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit because we're, we're pounding a lot on this forensic stuff. Um, I did want to because I did have an interview recently on my Rumble channel with a fingerprint expert. And he was it was interesting because he was quite skeptical, more skeptical, I would say, than I was about fingerprint evidence. Now, I've always thought of fingerprint evidence as a step down from DNA, but still fairly reliable. Would you opine on the current state of science on fingerprints, in your opinion, and your from your view? 
For sure. I mean, fingerprints are generally reliable. It really depends on, well, generally is maybe overstated, but the, it depends on the quality of the evidence, you know I mean? And there isn't any objective threshold for what makes a high quality latent fingerprint, but people have to remember that when you're talking about a latent fingerprint, what that means by latent is that it's not really visible. You know I mean? Is that it's a smudge at a crime scene that is raised up by a crime scene technician. And What's even more important about fingerprint evidence is that, well, one is that we don't know as a scientific fact established that fingerprints are unique, you know, I mean, which is, you know, they probably are, you know, they haven't found two that have been the same, but it's still not an established scientific fact. But what's more important in fingerprints is that we don't know how similar two prints can be. And we do know that latent fingerprints at crime scenes are just partial prints. And so if you don't have enough evidence, it's, and you don't have a high quality latent print, then you're really talking about not enough evidence to individualize to say that only that finger could have left that print, right? And so beyond that, and equally important, is that these are subjective judgments. This is somebody that's making a decision, a subjective decision. And right. there is no effort to shield fingerprint experts from cognitive bias. And bias is really one of the most pernicious aspects of forensic evidence because with Explain subject. Explain that a little bit because that, that, that doesn't, um, you kind of talked right through that, but that's well, extremely important. What is cognitive bias and how does that reflect it into fingerprint analysis? And Well, I'll, I'll give you the most kind of uh, well-known research study on this. After the Brandon Mayfield case, which is a high profile misidentification of uh, Brandon Mayfield, uh, who was arrested and uh, by the FBI for bombing the, the commuter train in Madrid, Madrid City, right? right? Yeah. And it was a false match. And there was a lot of evidence that the reason that all these fingerprint experts had matched it to Brandon Mayfield was because he was Muslim. He happened to be Muslim. He was married to an Egyptian national. And he had once uh, represented somebody that had been convicted of providing material aid to a terrorist organization. So to the FBI, that's our man. Then they, the court appointed an expert, um, an independent fingerprint expert, and the defense had an independent uh, expert. And they both came to the same conclusion that the FBI did, and that was Brandon Mayfield's print. But it wasn't. They were totally wrong. And so after that, because they identified the probable actual perpetrator who's still at large, the Spanish authorities did, and then they finally released and apologized to Brandon Mayfield. So after that, ETL George did a study. Um, it's a very well-known kind of neuroscientist in forensics. And what he did is that he took a group of uh, latent fingerprint experts, all very highly qualified, and he gave them um, cases to analyze. And um, what was clever about the, the experiment, though, was that he didn't tell these experts that it was their own prior casework that they were asked to analyze. They didn't know that. And what he changed was information in the case files that would have led, you know, they pointed one way or the other, like there was an eyewitness, there was a DNA match, there was a suspect confessed, something like that. And three fifths of those experts changed their original conclusions based on nothing more than the irrelevant information that was included in the case file. It had nothing to do with fingerprints. They had already made decisions on that. So that was, they were avoiding co like cognitive dissonance, right? Because like in their minds, they're like, this guy is guilty, right? And so they're going to see what our minds expect to see. That's what that, that, that really surprises me as. Even, even in my position and having dealt with criminal law, it, it kind of surprises me that it isn't like a DNA lab where the fingerprints come in, if they're analyzed, there's a bunch of people in lab coats that look under the microscope, and then it comes out and it's blind, but you're saying that, no, it comes in with a full report. Yeah, I mean, and all that information is totally irrelevant. You know, I mean, when I engage an expert witness, you know, I blind them from the case facts and most right. experts don't like it. They want to right. hear all about the case, right? You know, I mean, it's like, it's like, no, no, no. I'm just asking you to analyze this piece of evidence, you know, and can it be associated with this piece of evidence? That's it. You know, I mean, I, I, you don't need to know who my client is. You don't need to know what I want it to turn out to be a match or not a match or whatever is that I just want your objective unbiased opinion. And the, but that's very rare, you know, I mean, and so you think about, you know, there, there's so much resistance to the notion that cognitive bias is even an issue in, um, 
in forensics at all. Like many experts will um, take great umbrage to the notion that they could be biased, right? They look at right. it as like an attack on their professionalism, you know what I mean? And, and rather than a product of human decision-making, which we all have. Well, yeah, and it's one of the um, article, one of the, the fascinating things in Ideas and Answers in Law, my first book, that I, that I found is fascinating is that humans are not good judges of truth-telling, nor do they get better over time with training. So judges and police officers think that because they're in this position and they've seen so many liars, that they are somehow better at judging uh, a truth teller when that is absolutely demonstrated to be false. We do not get better with experience or by exposition, which is, which is fascinating. Um, as a, as a, and, but I think it goes to that. I don't know what there's a human desire to know. There's a human desire to solve. And to have a case that's almost solved, it, it somehow rubs us the wrong way. We don't want to say not all cases can be solved or, gee, this, this case is 80% solved. Right. We don't want that. We want to bridge that gap somehow. It's almost a human need for closure. Yes, I am. Um... You know, and we want definitive evidence too, right? You know, I mean, and this is why I need to turn on my light. I, uh, yeah, like, yeah. Well, the, well, you know, is definitive evidence. Fascinating. You should say that because I think that that people there's almost no substitute for good hard police work, and you know, good police work, good boot boot leather investigation. There's just no substitute for that, right? No, there isn't the. Um, but we want to have a magic box and a magic scientist that we can give them the evidence, and they're going to be happy. That was a nice little tour there. Thank you for the. Time. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My apologies. So, um, yeah. Well, well, what other what other problematic forensic science areas are you seeing in the country right now? You know, one of the other um, really important studies that Dr. Jor has done recently um, it involves forensic pathology and that we know that um, forensic pathology involves a lot of subjective determinations. And we know that biases affect all human beings, including doctors, including lawyers. And what we have seen in many um, Innocence Project cases are manipulations of, of time of death. Um, that is also subjective judgment. Sometimes those appear to have been deliberate, but many times they're because the pathologist understands what the prosecution timeline is and has an idea of when this person was supposed to have died. And relatedly is that we have shaken baby syndrome cases where... Oh, okay, here. I have, a, I have an associate. I don't know if you know Ray Warren. Uh, Ray Warren was in our office for many, many years, and he, he could talk all day about this shaken baby case that he had and about the the faux science of shaken baby syndrome. Um, maybe right. you can talk a little bit about that because that's an interesting, I, I know way too much about this topic. <laughs> right. Well, it's been kind of recast as abusive head trauma, shaken baby syndrome cases. And the idea was that there was a triad of, of uh, uh, symptoms that were manifest that meant that the baby had been essentially shaken to death. And this was retinal hemorrhaging and subdural hematoma and a, um, you know, like a brain bleed. And the, um, and the idea was that only like violent shaking could have like caused this type of injury. And you would see this and it would be diagnosed. It would provide both the, who the, the perpetrator was, right. You know what I mean? And like kind of a motive for it, right. Cause you're frustrated with the child or what have you. And there have been at least 35 wrongful convictions associated with this diagnosis. And it's still, you know, being used today. I, and the, I, I've, we've dealt with this many times in our office. I've had, I've been on both sides of this. I've been on the prosecutor side and on the defense side of this issue. It's interesting that the progenitor of the theory disputes it, right? So the person who came up with it doesn't buy it, you know what I mean? But it's become like this, this thing. And, and, the, and it is basically if there's three in, known injuries, there's a combination of three injuries that if that's it, then that's shaken baby. And then the, well, I know you've got to go pretty soon here, and your time is precious and valuable, and I am so honored that you spent it with us. Um, can can you can you uh, wrap up, or would you give us some final thought? Anything you want people to know? Like my my, I've got a pretty educated chat and pretty educated group, but what kind of things would you like to communicate? Uh, and I'll plug your book, and we'll stay on for a little bit since when after Chris goes, but. 
I, uh, you know, I, I would ask your listeners just to be skeptical, right? And this is like one of the things that I say when I train defense attorneys, really at the beginning of any talk I give is like that one of the real principles of kind of thinking about scientific evidence of any kind or science as it presented on television or in the news or what you read in something like the New York Times, right? That's always talking about a ballistics match, you know, or something like that without any skepticism at all is that, you know, lawyers are some of the most skeptical people on the planet. But when it comes to science, suddenly their brains turn off and they accept, you know, I mean, whatever it is that scientific evidence and that forensics in general, all are fallible. There's no such thing as an infallible forensic technique. There's no such thing as infallibility in science. And there's no certainty in science. If you're looking for certainty, you can't find it in science, right? It's not like math, you know, in the same sense, right? Science is a process. It's an iterative process that's always moving forward, right? And so what we know today might not be true tomorrow, you know what I mean? And we have to accept that as a society, you know what I mean? And the uh, and we have to be able to go back and look at prior cases that were prosecuted on what was thought to be valid science at the time, but we know today is not. Too many people are on death row today. Too many people have been exonerated as a result of wrongful convictions. We know today that 52% of all wrongful convictions are attributable, at least in part, to the misapplication of forensic sciences. So be skeptical. Pick up my book. Pick up the, book. Sure. the book. The book is Junk Science and the American Criminal Justice System. Steve, I really appreciate you having me on. It was wonderful, and I hope to see you. Uh, you know, Florida, we're cutting edge of wrongful convictions, so I'm sure you'll be back in Florida soon, and I'll see you at one of our conferences. And if so, I'll have to sign you one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. Thanks so much. Right, God bless you. Thank you very much for your work. How great was that? Is that to tell you, was that guy awesome or what? See, you only get this here at Steve Gosney's Rumble Channel. <laughs> I'm tapping into all these, all of these people that I just have tremendous respect for. And um, I'm tapping into them to kind of give you, you know, there hasn't been a lot of trial stuff going on. So I thought, um, I thought I'd bring on some of the people that I really admire and respect and have had an impact on me um, to share with you kind of my connections in the kind of the world that I live in. So I'm doing a little series on forensic sciences. We did, if you want to go back, there was a fellow, we did a, a fingerprint expert. This is Chris Fabricant. He's with the Innocence Project. He's the director of strategic litigation. And um, he is uh, spearheading a lot of the Innocence Project uh, junk science attacks and uh, excellent guy. And on Friday, we're going to have a DNA expert from South Florida. So we bring your DNA questions on Friday. Tomorrow, I'm going to be on with Chandler Remington. We're going to talk about death penalty debates, my, my newest book on the death penalty um, question. And a lot of people have questions about that. So bring that up. So was that good? If it is, say thumbs up and um, subscribe to YouTube. I'm not over my, I need to get monetized on YouTube. And uh, Rumble, I love you, baby. Wasn't that great? Makes me feel good. See, I'm supposed to be sick, but I've been coughing, but I don't feel bad because I'm so energized. Talking with somebody like Chris really energizes me. So um, that was wonderful. Don't you think? What do you think, chat? Good? Good show? All right. Well, thanks a lot for showing up, and we'll see you um, tomorrow at Chandler Remington's channel, and then Friday we'll be back here for um, DNA. All right? All right. God bless everybody. Thank you.